Here we go. Another episode of Off Script with Expel. I'm John Insinski, VP of Security Operations at Expel, and one of your hosts. With me is my co-host, Tina Velez, Manager of Solutions Architecture at Expel. Tina, go ahead and wave hello. Nice. Today, we're talking to Picking the Brain, Grilling Jerry Stilatos, Partner, Cyber Risk and Advisor at PwC, and my mentor for the last 12 years. Yes, Jerry, that number is in fact 12. Jerry, thanks so much for being here. John, Tina, thank you for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. And Sarah, we thank you so much for joining us, Jerry. Great. Jerry, let's start by having you talk about the role you're in now. Can you talk to us a bit about the work you're doing and some of the current challenges you're tackling? Sure. So I'm in PwC cyber risk and regulatory practice and primarily focused on cybersecurity which is top of mind for you know, uh, lots of our clients and organizations. You know, not a day goes by where someone's not talking about ransomware, hearing about how ransomware is likely affected, uh, either an organization or someone they know. So my background is incident response. I primarily have built a career around helping organizations prepare for and respond to ransomware, targeted threat actor in intrusions, um, other types of technical disruptions. And I spend a lot of time still doing that now around that readiness, that response. But we also spend a lot of time now, myself included, helping clients around recovery and a broader term of resilience, right? How do we reduce the likelihood that something bad happens, but then also to respond, recover, and emerge stronger from it? So uh, still have my hands around most, uh, you know, threats, threat actors, threat modeling, and understanding how organizations are trying to mitigate risk, but also spent a lot of time as well helping organizations think through um, how do we prioritize what's next after an incident, or what's the right level of maturity, or what should be our balance between risk and investment, and just helping organizations think through that strategy. Uh, you'd find, John, you and I have been through a lot of incidents, uh, you know, incident investigations, and that's certainly very time, you know, consuming, very stressful. And in some ways, the hard work starts just continues right after an incident, right? What should be those areas of focus? How do we continue to accelerate or evolve the program? So uh, certainly still doing it in response and spending a lot more time helping out what happens after the incident as well. Jerry, it sounds like you're spending a whole lot of time living in both this kind of tactical and strategic space in your current role and kind of where you've been. But our audience would really like to understand how you got to that point. So to, you're sitting in this chair now. You clearly have a wealth of different kinds of experiences in your background that give you that really good skill set to address things like resilience and creating that more kind of holistic approach to maturing security. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about your background? I mean, John has given me all sorts of dirt already, but our audience would love to hear about your past. It's the good dirt, Jerry, not the bad <laughs> stuff. It was only the good, the good parts. Good, and uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along, and we certainly would love to dig deeper. So, you know, to give you guys the elevator pitch on my career, I've been very fortunate. I've I've been able to develop both personally and professionally and work at some great organizations throughout my career. You know, I, I have to start, I'm from New York, Go Giants, go Yankees, uh, still true to heart, even though we're living in the, the northern, I live in northern Virginia now, but uh, I was very fortunate. I went to a school at the time, which was referred to as Utica College of Syracuse. It's now Utica University, and they had a very unique program, economic crime investigation, and they had two sub-concentrations, uh, forensic accounting and computer security. Now, I am a little bit older than you guys here, so at the time, computer security was intro to Windows NT, but it was a great program that got me exposed to network security, uh, white collar crime investigations, like we actually went to county courthouses and pulled records. But I also got exposed to computer forensics. And that just was fascinating for me uh, while in college and also my first job out of college, I can actually use software to recover deleted data or use software to investigate user activity or, or some type of activity. So that, got me thinking toward, okay, I want to be in some technical fields. I want to continue to learn. Um, you know, college helped provide a great baseline. I started working for a big four consultancy right out of college as well for my first year. And it was a really great experience to learn how business worked. Um, I was also in New York at the time of 9-11. And at that time, I was considering 
finding a job in government. I knew I was young, wanted to work for the government in some capacity, and was very fortunate that uh, I was able to get a job at the National Security Agency. So 9-11 happened. Um, I interviewed shortly after, came down to Maryland, and that really set my career moving forward. Uh, I was part of a cryptanalysis development program, intensive three-year rotation, which included classes. It included uh, rotations around the agency. Um, great place to start any type of career. Great mission, great, great colleagues, great intramurals for those of you that like to play sports as well. Until this day, some of my, my longest friends that I've had since moving down here, but it helped me build a great technical baseline. I also learned right away that I was a terrible programmer and better looking at data and analysis. So I, I kind of started taking steps, okay, how do I become a better anal a analyst? But I also was like, you know, I'm getting technical Monday through Friday. How can I continue to evolve and build myself? So I actually went for my MBA at night and it was a way for me to round myself out to learn more about business because I knew I wanted to get back to consulting at some point. So here I am, uh, you know, a couple of years into my career. I was kind of at an inflection point. I enjoyed working at the agency. I was going to school full time, but there was something that just felt like I needed to push myself and do another challenge. So um, I actually did a deployment to Iraq. At the time, this is, um, you know, war on terror, post 9-11. We also had the, the wars with Iraq going on as well. So it was a great time to support warfighter, go out into the field. Um, I was at a base, did not carry a weapon, uh, but I was fortunate actually to get that first real hand experience supporting what our troops were, were, were doing in the field. So for me, I got back and for someone that hated change, I decided to switch things up. I, I left the government, uh, moved into private industry, uh, moved out of Maryland and uh, probably made the best decision of my life because I had met my girlfriend, fiance and now wife at the time, now my current wife. Um, but it really was a pivotal point for me. Okay, move away, go back into commercial consulting. I did some e-discovery work um, where I met John was, I left that firm. I actually joined a firm that did support for the federal government. Uh, if you live in the DC area, you're either working for Uncle Sam or you might work for a contractor supporting Uncle Sam. Um, but was great for me, I got exposure working in a security operations center. You know, John and I worked for a, a agency within DHS, 30,000 plus hosts. So it was great exposure to see, okay, in this field of enterprise detection, enterprise response, you know, being able to be in a large environment. And for me, it was just another step forward of how do I continue building, learning, but also getting toward that goal of incident response. Um, you know, I was in a SOC supporting in a forensic and, and, and analyst ca capability, but I knew I wanted to do intrusion investigations, help clients, you know, respond to targeted threat actors, but also recover. So I was fortunate, uh, got a job at Mandiant, I spent the next five years of my career there and was very fortunate to have lived through and experienced a lot of different threat actors from different countries. And most notably, my last large engagement was Equifax. And after the Equifax breach, managing that for Mandiant and just going through the experience, it was just at another inflection point or time to, okay, I, I've gotten a lot of experience, right? How do I continue to, to, to grow professionally and personally? And that's what brought me to PwC. That's amazing. Uh, Jerry, I want to take a step back. You, you made a couple comments around kind of your passion or love. We'll call it more of a, a love for intrusion investigation, enterprise incident response. Sure. I, I love it too. But I think your audience would love to learn more in terms about what are the things that you love about it? Because obviously, you know, we don't want to spend our days programming, but chasing attackers around an environment, kind of fun, kind of exciting. Yeah. Talk to us about the things you love about that. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of things that are addicting about it, but certainly, you know, first and foremost, when you when you do this, you're helping clients, right? You're helping them at someone's having a bad day or a bad time, and you know that's where, you know, first and foremost, you know, client service, being able to help someone think through strategically, because most situations, you know, there's some overlap, but they're different. Second, you know, John, you and I were in the SOC, and what was one of the fun things we did was. How do we take big fix and perform searches enterprise wide? That strategy piece of, and this is before EDR became more prevalent, was, you know, how can I take one piece of data and then look for other systems in the environment that might have that? And as things have evolved, right, the approaches have changed too versus what we know versus how do I do more, 
methodology based or more anomaly. So the ability to take a piece of information, take that at scale, but in parallel, um, which is probably just as fun and challenging is, is containment and remediation, right? Thinking through not only finding all the breadcrumbs of a targeted threat actor, what systems they went to, what information they exposed, what accounts were compromised. You know, as we've talked, right, what's that extent of compromise, that extent of information exposure, uh, extent of assets, and then mapping that to, okay, I've got to change all passwords. I've got to rebuild systems. I've got to introduce or implement a series of controls or maybe other enhancements in a short period of time. Um, it's very time consuming. It's very stressful for clients and team supporting, but you learn so much in such a short matter of time. And just because the, the threat landscape and threat actors continue to evolve, you're constantly having to learn and adjust because what worked yesterday might not work today. I, um, you know, so, so certainly it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you humble, but it also leads to this confidence of being exposed and being able to help clients think through some of their challenging times. Yeah, I want to amplify a couple points as, as well is you talk about that customer service, that customer oriented mindset. I'm here. I want to help. It's a big part of it. I love it as well. Number two, problem solving. I've got a piece of data. I've established a lead. I'm in pursuit of this. And number three, like the constant learning. Would you agree with that? Like we're always having to learn because, you know, we establish a timeline of activity on a host. What did they do? Oh, I have to interpret that information and possibly discover new attacker techniques. It's the, it's the learning. And then the fun part to you said, not fun. I hate to use that word fun because it is stressful but the ability to translate those informations and learnings into a strategic plan for an organization to help them get out of it, uh, it does become a little bit addicting. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, it is fair to say. I, I can honestly say I'm probably, I've always been one of the dumber guys in the room and I own that, but, but that's the beauty of this job, right? Um, sometimes you're only as good and as strong as the person next to you. And so it's, it's certainly um, based on my, my Jesuit master's experience or education, continuous learning is important. You know, yeah. if you're not open to new things or different approaches, um, and, and in some ways it, it, it is, you know, addicting might be the wrong word, but there is a certain attraction that comes from it with wanting to find all the evidence, wanting to kick out the bad guys and um, but that certainly can be uh, a bit overwhelming at times too, when you're going from one back to back to back as well. Yeah. Jerry, I want to sh shift topics just a little bit, if that's sure. okay. John, um, before we do that, I think we should apologize to the audience for not including a trigger warning around invoking IBM's big fix. That got me right here. That is the, <laughs> I have, I probably still have ulcers, residual ulcers left over from working with that many years ago. But. Well, well, Jerry and I were using big fix before it became Tanium. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, all great technology starts from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I yeah. have that, that. That's a story for another time. Sorry, just had to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I, I, I saw the physical reaction to the, to, the, to the word big fix, and that really brought up memories. Querying at an enterprise level for, for user level run keys. We found a whole bunch of evil that way, though, didn't we, Jerry? We did. I, I mean, yeah. though, Tina, you hit on something there. Sometimes not everyone's going to have the, the latest, most greatest, and you have to just work with what a client has or what someone has. And I, that actually is, I think, part of the fun or challenge around the problem solving piece, too. I might not have all the, the great tools, but how can I cobble something together and make it work? Um, you know, not ideal, but certainly something that just adds to the, how do I bring the right approach and try and be technology agnostic? I, I, let, me, let me double down and amplify that for folks that are listening, maybe working in a SOC or working for an IR firm or like maybe you don't have the best in breed, make the most out of it, apply your learnings and maximize the return investment in that product. And, and trust me, that will deliver really good outcomes, both for the organization, but also for your development as well. This is speaking from someone that's maybe fought a little bit with a McAfee product here and there in their, in their career. Just, just saying. <laughs> wait, 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 John, John, there's making the best of it. And then there's also, if you know that you're wor not working with best of breed, the, whatever you have, create that feedback loop with the vendor you're working with to say, hey, this product could be this much better. Or if we created this thing, like we cobbled together this part around a feature that didn't exist. If you're not demanding the vendor space to continue kind of accelerating that, you're never going to get anywhere. So we know not everybody out there is working with the latest, shiniest things. And even if you are, chances are they're not deployed properly 100%. 
percent. But working with what you have and continuing to be curious and pushing for that kind of ongoing evolution is super key. I, I will get hung up on this idea of like, I have a bad tool set. I can't do good work. No, you just have to get super creative with it. That's the challenge that all of SMB and down market faces, but there should not serve as an excuse to say, I can't do this thing because I have a bad tool. Get creative and adapt with it. All right. Sorry, Soapbox. Well Just said. Well said. Yeah, very so well smashing said. that like button. We're yeah. smashing that like button. All right, Jerry, I want to shift topics here. Is At the start of this episode, I had shared that you've been a mentor of mine for 12 years. Nobody in the audience do the age math there. Um, please don't. Um, but I wanted to talk about the topic of mentorship. It's it's important to me because a part of this is sharing, uh, you know, listening and hearing about the journeys for 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 our guests, but also sharing our own. Um, Jerry's been a mentor of mine. I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am today sitting in this seat, not this physical seat in terms of my house, but this role I am in Expel. If it wasn't for Jerry's mentorship, and I mean that sincerely. So Jerry, I want to th throw a question your way. Is like when we talk about mentorship, when you think about being a mentor, you know. What does great look like in that context? And maybe what would also be helpful is there's also a responsibility for the mentee to kind of show up in that in that relationship as well. So anything you can share around this topic of mentorship, because you can have a massive impact. You specifically have had a massive impact on, on, on me specifically. But for the audience listening, if they think about mentorship or trying to be a mentee, like think about that. Yeah, John, first off. It's mutually beneficial here. Mentor, mentee, I think we both split the roles back and forth. Um, you know, second, you know, with all the jobs that I've had, um, and, and there's mentors outside of jobs as well. There's been mentors in school. There's been mentors in life as well for me. You know, there's always those names that stick out, you know, and, and there's too many here to mention all of them here. But if I had to go through and think through, and and, and you hit on something where, as I've learned and been fortunate to receive mentorship and been developed, it's how do I pay that forward with others? And a couple of key themes, being present. And being present doesn't mean just being in the same room, but it's being available as well. You know, I, I've had a saying with teams, if you're working, I'm working. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a night or weekend. You know, and unfortunately in this type of work, that generally leads to nights and weekends or where it's during your family time. But being there and being present so that people know you, you've got their back or that they can rely on you is something that is probably something I, you know, I instill and I, you know, I encourage those that as they start to mentor and develop others. Um, listening skills, you know, something I'm working on and trying to be better about as well, right? Sometimes as a mentor, you're, you're not being asked to solve a problem. You're not being asked to give recommendations or solutions, but you know, we all need to vent or sometimes we need to bounce ideas off or be, you know, a silent sounding board, especially when someone's not in their own environment. So being able to listen, but then also I'd say, you know, just the third point to bring up is, you know, consistency, right? And you touched on the mentor mentee role where, you know, I, I right now for people that I'm in a, a relationship leader for, you know, I've got a bi-weekly calendar invite. And what I say to them, though, is don't wait and please feel free to reach out to me before them. But that's their time. It's their time to bring up anything they want to chat with me about with respect to work, life, um, because it's very hard in light of COVID and just, you know, we're going to talk more about mental health in the episode, right? It's a lot for, for, for friends, colleagues, peers to deal with right now. So it's their time. And then what I like to do now is, and I'm trying to get back to basics is, you know, helping someone think through what their goals are, whether it's over the next quarter, the next year, you know, three years from now, and then helping someone think through, okay, what are those immediate steps or how do I start working toward those goals on a quarter by quarter basis, on an annual basis, and then being able to take a step back every year and reflect, okay, this is how much I've grown. This is where I am in my path or my journey. And, you know, you're not going to accomplish everything, but then you just helps you recalibrate. So, that consistency and that, you know, that maybe that last piece around, okay, where are you going and helping people think through how to get there? Um, that's what I've tried to bring. And, you know, from a mentee you asked, and, and then I'll stop rambling, um, you know, the situations that I've been very fortunate where someone has made the time for me, I view that as, okay, that is valuable time that they're giving me. How do I maximize that time with them? Am I showing up, being consistent, present? Am I coming to them with, you know, concise thoughts maybe, or here are the three things that I want to talk about, or here's the, 
here's the challenge I'm having versus showing up unprepared, not attending or, 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 or just not maybe, I, I don't want to say falling through, but, but, but certainly being prepared, showing up and like wanting to actually like embrace development as well. Because I do think sometimes back to the listening part, sometimes in my experience, it's, you know, you have to give both positive development as well as development to help them along with their career. And sometimes those are tough conversations, but being open to listening it is a valuable skill set for anybody, whether a leader or a mentee. Do you have any, you mentioned listening a few times and that's super important. Any tips or tricks when it comes to listening? Because I, I have a personal belief that, you know, we're not all good at listening. We all assume we are because we listen every single day. When it comes to listening, like how do, how do folks, how do you think about that? And how do you get better at listening? Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm very fortunate that Allison, you know, my wife, a mental health therapist, so uh, all joking aside, um, she is someone that's just helped me become a better listener. Um, just, you know, as I'm a father, parent to, to the boys as well. And I'm actually going through a training right now with my current employer at PwC, Inclusive Mindset. And one of the things that the training, you know, brings up as part of, it's a series of classes, some simulations, but you know, not speaking first, asking open-ended questions, letting people open up. You know, I prefer a word that you and I have talked about being authentic, you know, truly trying to ground rules, trying to be very open, trying to be very sincere, but also letting people have the opportunity to speak and share it. And to me, I think that goes toward building that rapport. And it's, if you take a moment to pause, let someone speak, let someone share where they're coming from, um, that helps build the relationship, but also helps you get better at, at having that patience and also knowing when to let someone finish, but also when to talk more possibly or ask more questions. Jerry, you have to stop stealing kind of the segue to the next part of the conversation, but you, you've totally nailed it here. So one thing I want to go back to is with regards to your background, you've been in big four, you were at the fort, you've done field work, you've worked for private sector, you've been on the consulting side. You also undertook an MBA while doing all of this other work and all of the kind of domain spaces that you've touched on and played in, none of these are easy going. These are super stressful kind of high demand reactive type roles. So thinking a bit around mental health and what that balance looks like, are there any lessons that you've learned over time that could help our audience? Like thinking about even just from a basic IR perspective, like how do you take care of yourself? When you're working with a client team who's having one of the worst days of their life, recovering from a massive event, like how do you frame things so that you keep your own sanity, you keep yourself in a good place? Yeah, um, wow, a lot to unpack there. It's a great question, Tina. and. You know, it's something that I've had to work on myself as well as, you know, find ways to try and improve and evolve. Because if I look at where I started to where I am now, um, you know, it's certainly been a journey. A um, cu couple things come to mind, you know, just with respect to, you know, stress, anxiety, pressure. You know, we mentioned COVID earlier, um, you know, for, for those that are listening and that are either married, significant others, you know, parents, right? There's a lot that comes at you, you know, outside of work. And then certainly when you're at work too. So, you know, a, a, a couple things that, that I feel have helped me, you know, as I've progressed, but also that I think I've tried to focus on more as I've gotten older. Um, and, you know, and I wish, you know, one of the questions you asked was, well, what, what did younger Jerry wish he would have known then as well, right? The balance between I love working out and exercise and finding ways to help me reduce stress through activities such as running, uh, lifting weights, playing sports, right? That is something for me has been a release that even now in light of COVID, right? Sometimes taking a call outside, we're taking a walk around the neighborhood while on a work call, right? How do I get that brief, you know, or, or you know, some, some separation from work, but also get some fresh air. So I think, you know, physical activity has helped me invaluably uh, throughout my career. Second, your support structure, whether it's family, whether it's friends, you know, especially with clients, you know, when you're helping a client through an incident, it, in some, some cases, it's, it's the worst experience that they've had, 
right? And we're not here comparing incidents to the loss of life, but the, in that particular moment, right, the stress, the will I have a job, will the company survive, it can be very overwhelming. And then to think through all the work that needs to be done. So it's bringing a balanced approach that it's we're here, we're helpful, a calm demeanor, but certainly helping them start thinking through and moving, looking forward, right? The bad days were yesterday. Each day is going to get easier. So having that optimistic mindset as well, that also helping them think through how they're going to come through this and emerge stronger, because we all want to reduce the likelihood of a day like this moving forward. So that optimism, that that professional approach, that being present for them, you know, in some ways it's coaching. In some ways it's being available as well, even if it's, you know, not before eight or after 5 p.m. Um, you know, and then lastly, I think being able to talk about it, you know, that's one thing, you know, some people might use exercise, some people might use medication, some people might go to therapists, and I've, I've tried, I've done them all, and I still do a mix of those. But as I found as I've gotten older, you know, more comfortable in my own skin of talking about, you know, what's stressful, what's working, what's not, but then also being open to listening about, should I be trying something different? Because I think just as part of that journey of, you know, what worked for Jerry at 25 is not going to work for Jerry at 45. And don't worry, I'm not 45 yet. Uh, but 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 you under, you get the picture, right? In this constant evolution of, right, uh, how I handle stress now is much different than I did when I was 25. And it's just been part of the journey, too. So you continually mention that, like that need around identifying what worked yesterday isn't going to work today. That seems to apply, at least in the framework you've presented, to pretty much all aspects of your life. Like you're just constantly iterating, making Jerry V whatever version is going to be better than what Jerry was yesterday. And I think something that we've seen even talking with some of our other guests is that there is a mix of that curiosity and need to always push for whatever's next. Question for you around that, though. How do you make sure that you're still maintaining that balance if you're always looking forward and always pushing forward? Yeah. Um, now you sound like my wife, Tina, talking to me about mindfulness, which is a great, great <laughs> segue and plug, right? Um, I think for someone like myself that's been anxious or, you know, fear of failure, fear of, you know, what might be the unknown in the future, it's, you know, as I've gotten older, one of the things I've been very mindful of or self-aware is, how do I stay present in the moment? Like enjoying the moment right now of, of speaking with both of you on this webinar, you know, versus what's next week or the week after. And, and that's something where, you know, has taken time and has taken effort, right? But that focus, trying to be better about, okay, I'm present right now and, you know, focus on what you can control. That's something always that, you know, I, I, I recommend to teams. It's something to follow from a, approach philosophy standpoint as well. And I think it's gotten better for me as I've gotten older, part maturity, part wisdom, part great coaching from my wife. Um, but all joking aside, uh, that was hard for me, like worried about how do I keep up or how do I stay relevant? And, you know, that's something that I've had to learn to adjust with. Right. And, and you know, the one question you asked, you know, what would I say to younger Jerry? You know, I would say to take a breath more pause that I, you know, in some, some ways I am where I am today because of that drive, but it's also in some ways I know it affected relationships. I know it affected things in my personal life. Right. And there's, there's a balance with that. Right. And I think now with, you know, the, the lessons learned of, of where we are today and, and certainly coming out of something like, you know, personal experiences, COVID, you name it, it's that right balance and being present you know, we're not going to get yesterday back. So try and be in the moment, enjoying as much as we can. And we've kind of touched on this a bit so far in conversation, but with thinking about kind of younger Jerry, right? What are those additional, because you've given us one, but what would be two other things that you would say, young Jerry, these are things that you should know. I'm speaking to you from the future. I'm wearing a coat, even though the other two folks on this podcast clearly did not get the memo about the dress code. But what kind of lessons learned now would you send to your past self? Yeah. Um, one, I think I said pause, right? This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And and I think having the hindsight of that at this point in my career, um, start saving more money now, younger Jerry, because as you get older, um, 
all looking aside, right? I think this, you know, uh, you know, I think with with any type of job or anything, right? Um, thinking through the balance between money as well as the right role, you can find more money, but it might not be the right role for you at that your time in your career or the right experience. And, you know, I, I think one of the things I did earlier on in some capacity was made decisions based on money versus the right role or what was next as part of that broader journey. And, you know, and then lastly, um, you know, there, there's certainly an element of planning with any of our careers. I, I think what I've tried to do is, you know, probably would have been more present for, you know, this job has consumed things, you know, you know, just to share personally, you know, when your client is having an issue, you're, you're having an issue. It's affecting your nights and your weekends. And the balance between work and life is something I've had to work on that, that separation. So I wish I would have started doing that sooner where we're at the dinner table and I'm not checking my phone or putting blackout periods maybe on my calendar or, and or, or finding different approaches to that. So I think that balance between work and life is something I've worked at a lot the last couple of years. I wish I would have started doing that sooner because I think it would have, my wife was affected by it, you know, and she's been my, you know, my, my biggest advocate, my biggest coach supporter, but in some situations, you know, not fair to her, just given some of just, you know, things that have happened. Right. So it's finding that better balance as well. Well, I'd say we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and being so candid as well about some of these things that you've learned and experienced kind of through out your trajectory. And the fact that we're all still very much works in progress, I think that's also going to be a recurring theme for this series. Yes. But John, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to ask before we sign off. No, Jerry, I just wanted to thank you again for joining us. We really appreciated all that you've shared across so many various topics. And, you know, kudos to you for referencing Allison so many times in the boys. I'm going to mention my wife really quickly in case you listened as well. Sapna, hey, how's it going? Just so to make, make you look bad. But Jerry, I just want in all seriousness, thank you so much. I re really appreciate it all that you shared here. Today. I really enjoyed the chance to speak with both of you. Thank you for having me and look forward to uh, supporting you guys moving forward too. So take care. Well, thank you again. And for our audience, I hope you stay tuned for our next episode and register and hope you enjoyed this one as well. And that's it for today. That's a wrap. So thanks all. Here's the wave. Bye. <laughs>